section and not on that section there. We restrict, uh, with a few exceptions like parking meters, stop signs, we restrict things that can be in that two foot zone just to segregate people from moving traffic. Mm -hmm. So there is that element of it. Um, and that makes sense. Yes. In this case, um, I think it looks we have a lot of diagonal parking downtown. Yeah, I was going to say, the other one is, is exactly what Michael was just going to say. It's the diagonal parking, while well, somebody comes around a curve and you're walking along that and they diagonal park, a big portion of their vehicle, especially some of these larger trucks and SUVs, is across that mm -hmm. apron. And so if you're walking there, they're hitting you. So this is to try and move you back up toward the, sto the storefront. So Greg, this side is just saying it is very concrete. concrete. Can we uh, require that, like, set a standard for the whole downtown area so that one block doesn't have, you know, a hearing bone pattern and the next block has a chest board pattern? And that's part, I think, Greg's question is, is do you how, how do you do you want this to be uniform around the entire square, or are you okay with one block doing it one way and another block doing another? I think it would look better if it was uniform around the whole square. I agree. I think we can bring you a uniform pattern. Again, we want to know though is is stamped concrete? Is it yeah. traditional brick? Is it you need to go back and get traditional bricks? Mm -hmm. I mean, we got somebody told me in the comments on this. We have plenty of traditional bricks in the middle of the road. Admire them there. Mm -hmm. so, exactly. But. Um, I think stamp concrete is the way to go, just for everything. I agree. I just don't want to have a something legal come up because if we feel or the, I to say the customer or the owners feel that we're forcing them to do this again, like we did 20 years ago, because there was a lot of negativity. Absolutely. Um, there was a lot of money that had to be spent by store owners. Because if you if you remember, you were a lot younger, and I was a lot younger. I know. And uh, everywhere you walked down the sidewalks, you had those metal plates that you had to walk on. There was a lot of structural they had to do. There was a lot of cost. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure that store owners are uh, for it, and they do have a say. Well, we're, I don't want to force anybody. I don't have the wherewithal to go force all of downtown to start converting to stamp concrete. But we wanted to know if it was even a possibility. Again, the mm -hmm. other issue I have with that we will have to address, and we may need some assistance with getting this information out, it's how it is maintained. I guarantee you 75% of our problem is how the concrete is being maintained. When I walk downtown on a winter's day, it's completely clear, and there's icy melt and salt all over the place in piles in front of some of these. Water softener. Yes, just that is not going to make the other hard part is when you put technically when you put concrete down, you shouldn't be putting anything on it for two years, correct, Tim? Yeah, a year to two years. They recommend two years. Definitely, the first year you want nothing on it. We do not salt any year. of our new roadways yep. at all in the winter when we put down new concrete. And these are the kind of things we really need to get out there. That here's how you maintain them. Here are our alternatives. A lot of it is when it snows, get out and get the snow off there. And it doesn't pack and then you've got, and then you don't have to worry about the ice because it's not such a big issue. I know for the north facing facilities downtown, it's a little bit of a different story. Yeah, yeah. my hope is that like Jonathan's group can help kind of educate uh, when it comes to that because it is a big investment. Mm -hmm. And you know, we want to make sure that the business owner gets, or the building owner gets the benefit of that uh, for the longest so with DTR coming around, is that something that we could potentially utilize that for to help out the business owners or as a as a city project in that category? That's exactly where my mind was going. I mean, just think hypothetically because it's infrastructure related. Because yep. it does streets and curbs and, and you could hypothetically do a 50-50. I mean, that that to me would seem like shared investment in a sense. Yep. It's really, when it comes to DTR, it's what your priorities are. If you feel like right. you're getting a lot of bang for your buck out of replacing stamped concrete, or if it's redoing whole frontages and facades of downtown businesses. Well, yeah. and some of these ones are gonna have double lots or whatever, you know, 500 bucks to somebody might not be a lot, but when you're starting to get into the thousands, because they own multiple lots, it starts to add up after a while. So if there is something yeah. that could potentially help those business owners out or building owners out, 
I, I'm anticipating that they're going to want to know what's door A, B, and C and the costs. Yep. So and then the next question I'd bring up, since we have a new HR manager, that is really well with grants. Get to get to get, the boy, get to get some, some opportunities <laughs> out there with grant writing that maybe we can help some of the business owners out with a grant. And we'll continue to look for those opportunities. I mean, Jonathan's group does as well as in-house. Um, we just wanted to know conceptually if we're going in the right direction. And if it sounds like we are, we can work out a lot of those details as those programs become available. The other one may be freeing up. Um, the idea I had on this one, and we kind of discussed, is this block specifically may be a nice pilot program. Get this one done quickly or allow these property owners to band together and do one themselves if they were willing to. Or someone that would cover the cost. Let them do it and then see how it holds up. And then we're like, yeah, it looks really good. It holds up well. We're, we're through a winter. Let's keep moving. Let's start hitting the rest it's of the blocks. It's pretty much what they used in front of Fastmart, right? In there, in that where that's what the sign That's exactly so, what that So, I mean, that is. would have a year right there to determine, and that's kind of where the majority of the snow was sitting, you know, to give it that kind of highlight. The one across the street with stoplight there by Roths really needs to be fixed bad because those bricks are... There's different things he keeps in some areas. And then again, like I said, there are whole blocks that are pristine. There is no issues. Yes, me and Tim were wandering. He saw me wandering around staring at the ground the other day. He got to try to make sure I was okay. And it's just the nature of the beast. There are just some that are in good condition. There are some that aren't. And once it goes, then it's going to keep going. If you don't take care of it immediately, it will precipitate itself and keep spreading. I think so. your stamp concrete is the way to go. Yeah. Did I feel strongly in a different direction, or we're not going to go? With, we'll put together an, an offer up a program, and then also discuss with the specific business owner going to sewer how they want to proceed. Okay. So we good? Good. Yep. Yeah. All right. That's item number six. Item number seven: Resolution designating one handicapped or disabled parking space on the south side of Jackson Street West of Sixth Street Highway 15. Uh, this was a request by Councilmember Hendricks to look at adding some more ADA parking to the block uh, that came, contains 139 North 6th Street. And so uh, we designed this up, the design's in there, and we did check with the uh, council member, and uh, she said it, it'll work, it's good. And so this, this will help. Again, this is probably, we always talk about, at least in the context of downtown, while the city is not required by law put these there, the standard, usually for a standard size downtown block, if you have full parking across it, uh, diagonal parking, is one stall per block base. And when you add them together, a standard block would have four, that's on the physical block, not four on a block of a street. So this would, I believe, be the fourth. There are two on the south side. Is that correct? There's one on the south side. On the south side, one, one in on front the of west. the municipal building. I swear there's two. Isn't there one by the alley, by Burroughs? Yeah, I thought there were yeah. two on yeah. the yeah. south side. Yeah. By Kirby yeah. Roth yeah. and then by... Yeah. I think there's two in Burles. the block, yeah. in front of Roth and then yep. in front of Burroughs. So this would also be our, our fourth one on the block. Yeah. So. Which is okay because you can't put one on the team. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'd have to get the permission of the state. But yeah. you can, like we did, it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. Like we did with uh, the one by the mail, that's an offloading to the side. Questions or comments on item number seven? I'll introduce a resolution. All right. The resolution, the resolution has been introduced and is designated as resolution number 2021-9. Would anyone like to move that this resolution be passed and adopted? Second. second. Moved by Schmidt, second by Hendricks. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Motion for discussion. Seeing none, please call the roll. Hendricks? Yes. Miller? Yes. Camperin? Yes. 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 Wilson? Yes. Holderman? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Item number eight, ordinance amending the Sewer Municipal Code, Chapter 325, Sewers, Article 6, Sewer Use, Subsection 3, Grease, Oil, and Sand Interceptors, to adjust requirements for collection and disposal of grease. Tim, you want to take this? This was born out of the realization that we as a city 
do not have a real good handle on what restaurants are doing with grease and oil, whether they're pouring it down the drain, are they uh, having it hauled off, what are they doing? Um, we have no way to police them. And so looking at this ordinance, we realize as a city that if they're putting it down the drain, we're creating certain health risks and potentially damaging our sanitary infrastructure. So what we did is we looked at a few of the communities around. Nobody really had any oversight on Greece per se. No, they claim they really don't have an issue. Um, we unfortunately don't see that. We, we've seen some, uh, Tim Rich take as, as uh, reference that sometimes he's finding uh, uh, plug sewers and that he's having to go uh, clean out. Um, people are, restaurants are running the grease right down the drain as opposed to collecting it and then disposing of it. So with that, we put this ordinance together. Um, we defined a few easy definitions, fats, oils, greases, uh, what a grease strap is. We defined that this is primarily a, a food service establishment ordinance, and we defined wastewater. What we've also done is we've declared it a public nuisance that should they violate any of these requirements, we now have an avenue that we can pursue them. Um, under the food uh, service establishments that discharge wastewater, there, there will be some new requirements. They will, there will be some record requirements. They're going to have to track their uh, annual grease pickup, the company that's picking it up. They're going to have to demonstrate that their employees uh, have, have a knowledge of compliance for handling fats and oils. Um, we've also added a, uh, a uh, clause in there that the grease tanks themselves are now going to be required to be on the premises where the restaurant is located. Uh, they, they will not be allowed to be in right-of-ways uh, where they could potentially spill and then people track through it and, and track it all over downtown. So my question. Kelly, once you have a business that's been in, uh, established for say 20, 30 years, are we going to force that since our ordinance was not established say 20 years ago, where does that business owner stand when we come at? Do we are we going to make these uh, older businesses update everything now? If they remodel, okay. they will be required to come up to the new standard. A, a new business coming in is going to have to detail their plan for grease and oil disposal. And Tim, Tim Rich Tate, the water wastewater uh, director, will be the one that will approve that plan. But that's just on new business. That's on new. Now, if you remodel, you will be required to adhere to this. We, okay. we will have to. Now, as far as existing, I, they're, they're already not supposed to be doing it, but we really didn't have anything on books as an ordinance for, for a city. So but I'm going to say going forward, even though we didn't have anything on the books going forward, there ain't much <clears throat> we're going to be able to do unless they remodel. Right, well, no, we're not yeah, gonna... yeah, I mean, we, we'll be able to have a talk with them, right? Um, it, at least Tim has the... This ordinance will give Tim Richtig, or the wastewater manager, the authority to legally enter and review their processes. Can we do that? Yeah, I don't think, this isn't a zoning ordinance, okay. correct? This is going to be in our actual municipal code book. Correct. Mm -hmm. as, a, as an ordinance that I've researched this for other municipalities, you will have the ability to enforce this. There wouldn't be grandfathering in like you would see in a non-conforming use. ordinance on file that you could be prosecuted. So they're dumping grease in the alley, doesn't matter how long they've been doing it, this applies. Yes. Mm -hmm. and what, as far as Tim's comment though, like as far as the infrastructure or the, the traps and the other, can that be enforced on day one? As far as, you know, you say, you know, do they have to wait for a remodel? Well, that, I mean, that sounds like a building, you know, building and safety issue, but I believe this ordinance, it's going to go in our actual code book not in a building reg or a zoning reg, I think you can enforce it right away. Okay. 
that's something we'll probably have to work on internally to make sure we're all on the same page. With that, that. And then also make sure our current restaurants and that. So you'll, you'll want to advertise and make everybody yeah. aware. Yeah, I mean, we're going to want to, should this move forward, we're going to want to notify all, and not just restaurants. We've got Concordia, which runs a restaurant. Um, and I'm sure we have some other establishments that have restaurants that aren't technically public restaurants. I mean, I, I just don't want to see us be the sheriff and go into every business because now we have an ordinance and then we're going to upset business owners and we don't want to do that either because, you know, we're representing our taxpayers right. and we start doing that, uh, we don't want to upset them either, but we got to be very cordial on how we handle it. Well, and I, 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 where this stemmed from is problem, uh, problem area. And we just didn't have the ability to go in and say, hey, why is this happening? Now we will have that ability, hopefully, to at least go in and research what's going on. Are they dumping it down the drain? Is that what's creating our problem? Up to this point, we've had suspicions as to Correct. who might be the, you know, the ones doing this. But to Tim's point, without something on the books that would allow us to investigate it further, we really couldn't do anything. In some cases, there's a little literal trail of grease to follow as far as figuring out where it's coming from. And so I think part of it's going to be just education. And again, this isn't something where we're not looking to kick down doors and find people. You know, this is just really an educational process, explaining them what the issue is. Because now we could, now we have that, we can have that conversation if this is on the books and say, Here, here's what we like to do. Here's the issue we're seeing. This is causing a problem for a lot of the downtown. This is what we ex our expectations are moving forward. Do you have any questions? Or, you know, what, how can we help you basically get in compliance? Um, now, obviously, if this is a year or two from now, and someone's going down the alley and dumping a bucket of grease, yeah, we're going to have to you know, take action on that. But that, the, the goal with any of these is not to kick down doors on day one. And, and, and so if they have, if, I understand you're saying they're now moving in. It has to be disposed upon on premise. I'm assuming that is in there because there are some people that don't have that on premise currently that we need to correct. 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 Or they're dumping in the alley, or they're disposing it someplace else. That's if, not. if they're dumping in the alley, there's environmental laws on that, and, and we don't have to even have an ordinance to enforce that. Correct. That, that that's environmental law. All you gotta do is call DEQ or EPA, and they'll come assist you because that, there's environmental laws for that. But again, the, the goal is is not to to be to beat up on on business owners. You know, the goal is by by us doing this at the local level, we can be the ones that can go and talk to them. You know, we can go in and try and educate and, and go through this process. And this just gives us the means of again uh, be able to address this bigger issue. But we want to do it strategically. And, and to your point, John, you know, there are other other options out there, but those would be beyond what our ability to. The other huge one, and, and Mike can sort of speak to this because this has been percolating for a little bit. When Mike was working at Olson and we were doing the wastewater system study, one of the things we identified in the system study is that we think there is an issue within the system with this problem. You can't track it to any one specific one, but there's enough of them in the way that the loading looks like when it hits the wastewater plant which again, remember that your wastewater plant, we're trying to string along to make that thing last quite a few more years as we gear up to build a solution to that facility. That's why we moved the outfall and these other things. This loading that's being caused by what we suspect is probably fats, oils, and greases is causing a lot of pressure on that wastewater plant. Mm -hmm. That we've identified that if we can reduce some of that pressure, again, prolonging some of the systems in there as we continue to find that next solution. The other one is I've literally stood downtown with Tim and his crew and looked in these sanitary sewers when they're jetting them because somebody's downtown basement is flooding with all kinds of fecal matter because I can guarantee you it was a fat oil and grease issue that clogged the 100 year old downtown sanitary sewer line. So we really got to get a handle on this because this is also causes a property damage issue.
but that system is not designed well enough and interconnected enough that you can't sit down up there directly and start pointing fingers at certain business owners or anybody else to find a responsible party. So by doing this, we're also protecting the private property owners downtown from issues we know we are having. I've, I've done it too many times, and so I want to protect that large asset that we need to prolong as long as possible, and then also to protect our property owners, because it can happen anywhere. This can, from Concordia and their facilities, anywhere that's using oil to bake and do other things well, that they're doing. I assume the schools are doing that properly, but you know, you never but know. But you don't know, mm -hmm. and so we want to, for the safety, I mean, we had, again, I'm not pointing any fingers, but we had a significant backup right around the school facility. Now, my question is, because here we go again, there's opportunities out there that will assist you with the government. I mean, I went through it. They, the region, the regional seven out of Kansas City, DEQ, five, six years ago, came into town and they put monitors on all the systems because we had issues with oils and grease then. So how, if we're having this issue and we know this, Tim knows the outlets that he can have them come in there and put monitors in them sewers and pretty much trace it right to the culprit. The, 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 so the, the, Tim has tried to do sampling and it's notoriously difficult. The reason is, is samplers operate on a liquid flow mm -hmm. and typically the fat oil and grease will be solidify or separate because uh, you know oil and vinegar, sim similar Still. oil and water, the oil <coughs> flow. So as you try to maintain a sample, so it samples for two seconds every hour as an example, mm -hmm. you have to be incredibly lucky to capture a slug at that moment. And it's, it's just been very difficult to pinpoint. So what you would normally do for an industrial polluter is, uh, is sample continually upstream until you're within two manholes of where that pollution is coming from. Yeah, and I, they, I mean, I was a part of that when, the, that, when yeah. they came in but they can go right to the, where that outlet is on that business and they can put a spike right there. And, and so some of these we suspect are when they clean uh, a kitchen like the grease hood, you know, as an example. So you have a week shutdown, you don't have the cafeteria going. Coincidentally, we have a huge slug loading at the treatment plant. Um, we do understand uh, it, it is, I would, I would suggest that pinpointing on fat oil and grease is it's is far more metal, difficult than... They do the seven metals, oils, and grease. And, yeah. and also, you, you, often you have to be at the, at the right time right. when they're and actually you, dumping. You can so. have a continuous monitor on that system. It, it, just, it stays there and it monitors a constant. And, and like I said, I know the state would assist on that if we know there's some culprits out there that, and it's continuous. And they're continually monitoring that uh, where it's spiking and it's reading that. And I, I just, if we do know that there is something, but something out there that we should be take, to taking it to that next level, because then it goes all the way downstream to the wastewater, and then it kills the enzymes and everything else that we're trying to treat our water with. And we should be uh, dealing with that. We certainly can redouble our efforts to find and, sampling procedures. And, and our hope is that this would be a first step towards that, and that if there is the voluntary compliance, once we have a chance to talk to the business owners, Maybe this issue goes away. If obviously they persist, and, and, and we're, we're trying to pinpoint one particular uh, business, like to John's point, we can always take the next step of monitoring once we get a better idea of, of where it's coming from. Um, but yeah, did you sum up? I have a question with you stating in there that it has to be on the premises. Um, all are aware of a business that has it across the street. Have they been contacted and spoken with as far as where they need to relocate theirs on their premises now? And that's all in solution and everything? It is a process, yes. Okay, cool. Let's do it. This would help with that process. Yeah, I think as long as everybody gets a letter, you know, as long as you send out a letter stating that this changes then, and then it's the proper chain of communication, we're good. I'll argue the word. An ordinance to repeal and replace the municipal code of the city of Seward, chapter 3.5, sewers, article 6, sewer use, section 3, grease, oil, and sand interceptors, to adjust requirements for grease, oil, and sand interceptors, to repeal all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict, to provide for an effective time to provide for publication of this ordinance in pamphlet form. The ordinance has been read by title and is designated as ordinance number 2021-13, and the title is hereby approved. 
I need a motion to dispense with the statutory rule. So moved. Second. Moved by Wilkins, second by Hendricks. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Hendricks? Yes. Miller? Yes. Hamprin? Yes. Hamilton? Yes. Schmidt? Yes. Wilkins? Yes. Holderman? Yes. Fetch? Yes. Um, again, this is ordinance number 2021-13. Would anyone like to move that this ordinance be passed and adopted as read? So moved. Second. Moved by Camper, second by Hendricks. The motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question is, shall ordinance number 2021-13 be finally passed and adopted? Please call the roll. Hendricks? Yes. Miller? Yes. Hamper? Yes. Singleton? Yes. Schmidt? Yes. Wilkins? Yes. Goldsman? Yes. Yes. This is our only ordinance this evening, so we need one final motion to make this ordinance a part of the permanent record. So moved. Second. Moved by Wilkins, second by Hendricks. Motion and a second. Please call the roll. Hendricks? Yes. Miller? Yes. Hamper? Yes. Singleton? Yes. Don't kick down doors. Just make sure we were clear on that. <laughs> right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Uh, item number nine, consideration of the letter agreement for professional engineering services with Short Elliott Hendrickson Incorporated for improvements to East Sewer Street from current city limit to Highway 34. Greg. The remaining portion of high, uh, East Seward Street or East Seward Road, as it's referred to in the county, uh, is an item identified in our one and six year plan. Uh, administration has been working with the county and our city representatives on the county board on putting together an interlocal agreement that's currently before the county attorney's office to work to pave this project and finish it out as we started it all the way to Highway 34. Um, knowing that's coming up and always been a potential within the plan of the city to continue to expedite that, that process, uh, we brought forth the letter agreement from SEH, uh, which is Jake Posh, a former city engineer's firm. Um, Jake designed East Seward as it was completed currently, and so we felt that that was good to keep that continuing on, and so we got the recommendation to go forth with that. And so we have that here for you tonight. Our hope is to approve this, get his firm started, uh, potentially bring forth an interlocal that uh, Commissioners Brocky and myself have been working on along with the mayor. Uh, before both of these bodies finish that up potentially this summer as we also work on and finalize the one and six in the, the budget kind of in the summertime and then uh, with development and engineering and design being done in the fall and going out for good in the fall so this can be a project that's finished out next construction season. I have a question. Where, where does this work start exactly? Right where we stopped. Okay. So okay. about uh, Evergreen. Yeah, before Evergreen comes up off the highway and meets up with East Seward Street, we paved to approximately close to the church, just past the church. Okay. So uh, it's kind of right in between houses where the, the development stops there, where essentially Ridge Run mm -hmm. up faces to East Seward Street and then kind of the houses that were the rural homes begin. Okay. So there's just a dead stop that turns to asphalt. So if you drive out that way, that's where it stops. The county has struggled or tried to decipher what to do with the rest of that roadway. And there's been decisions back and forth, but the current county commission has put this in their one and six year last year. They re-added it again to this year, correct, Commissioner? Correct, it was added, I think, two weeks ago. Yep, and so this would be us, most likely what, the, what we're proposing will come to you as a 50-50 agreement between the county and the city. So I know that the, the neighbors on the brick portion are very concerned about that brick being taken away. I've heard from several of them. No, 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 no. I, I know, I know that. I this is out you, in the county. I know this that. I just want because yes. if they hear East Seward Street, they kind of get nervous. So yes. that's what I just wanted to go on record. Yeah, when you're going up the hill. I, I know yeah. where it is. I just wanted to have it in the record that that is not what we're dealing with here. Yeah. That's why it was explicitly written the way it was written. <laughs> I instructed Vinny to write it that way Lady because we get the call. There will be a, uh, a meeting with the council members that represent those two districts. An informal meeting will invite those that live on East Seward on that stretch. Perfect. And then also the ones I believe that are on 
Jackson as well to the north because a lot of people cut up and then go up Jackson as well. We're going to invite them to a meeting to have a discussion. That project is three years out plus in our current one and six, and so we want to discuss with them what their thoughts and ideas are for that area. So that's a different meeting that I'm trying to get scheduled. So this is only for that portion of the asphalted, uh, kind of improved um, county portion of East Seward Street slash East Seward Road. Now, if the county decides not to approve it, then what happens? Is there a 50 percent? Right now, we're on the hook for the engineering on this okay. as we start now, which again, the project I think is in the general development of the city. So, in case we also annexed out there, now we have plans done. So even if it fell apart, at least the city walked away with developed plans, and if for some reason we annexed and it became our roadway, we could also still have these plans to utilize for development. So I don't think we're out of a loss one way or the other. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Just a comment, and for those of you that don't know me, I'm Daryl Zabrocki, and I am the uh, District 2 Commissioner for the southern half of Seward, basically. Um, the document in your packet that you're going to review here was presented to the county board in our morning meeting. So they now have that document as well. Uh, Greg alluded to the interlocal. Uh, Wendy has given me some changes and I begin in touch with you to discuss those changes and we can finalize that interlocal and bring it back to our respective uh, governing bodies. So we're about on the same page with all of this. It's just a matter of finally getting us all in one room in a sense. And, uh, and then making some decisions as to who pays for what, when, and the timeline that Greg alluded to is kind of where we're at. We would like to see this go forward through the summer months here with uh, finalization, bid letting in the fall, with the idea that we're ready to go with construction, construction season 2022. Now that's a mouthful and that's an awful lot of, of hope and prayer in a sense, but that is kind of the direction that I think we're going and uh, in my conversations with Greg, I think that's where we want the city to be with us. So uh, that's my comments on the, on the matter before you as it is. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the council? I make a motion that we approve the letter of agreement. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Camper, second by Singleton. A motion and a second. Please call the roll. Kendrick? Yes. Miller? Yes. Camper? Yes. Singleton? Yes. Schmidt? Yes. Wilkins? Yes. Coltman? Yes. Beck? Yes. Item number 10, permit application for Doug Oberhauser, 360 Blacksburg Lane. Greg. Uh, this was one you had previously, but the actual uh, well driller was not bonded with the city, so we held it up, and, or we didn't approve it because it was conditional. They never bonded. It fell apart. Oberhauser got a bonded one. Tim Rich Tig. Signed off on this. We're good to go. We have no issues with it. Move to approve. Second. Move by Schmidt. Second by Singleton. Motion and a second. Please call the roll. Hendrick? Yes. Miller? Yes. Singleton? Yes. Camper? Yes. Okay? <laughs> yes. Wilkins? Yes. Coltman? Yes. Beck? Yes. All right. Next we have reports. We have a brief city administrative report. Uh, spent a lot of time trying to get a city clerk. Thank you for getting us a city clerk. <laughs> spent a lot of time onboarding and e-verifying and having our staff e-verify and do all, all kinds of other clerk things. So excited to have uh, Derek on board and look forward to working with him. Um, one of the big ones I think it's going to eat up a lot of time, as we alluded to at the last meeting, is the Wellness Center. We had a meeting tonight. And so to gear up to properly move that, there's going to be a lot of moving parts. The biggest one for you guys is probably I really need to get some feedback on what you would like to see at the point that you make the decision to put something on a ballot in the future, to make that decision and defining what you will need to have to make that. I think we have a general idea of what we want that to look like now in our discussions, but we need to get you whatever information you need with, that we can actually get. Some of it is a chicken or the egg situation. But, but build enough information so that you can make uh, an informed decision this summer of whether to move forward as that was presented based on your feedback. But that's what we worked through tonight. And then we're also like trying to back channel uh, plan.
different earmarks. You know, if, if we plan to have the vote work way, our way backwards and, and define what rules uh, would be had there. So uh, we did present the item to the county board uh, and just kind of inform them on it. Um, and so we continue to, to work forward on that. But that's kind of going to be a quick process. So I'd probably work with you individually to try and define some of that and get that going to look to maybe bring that forth this summer to, to see if you want to put it on the ballot or not. And then, again, looking for probably a fall special election. So that's probably the biggest one that's needed a lot of time we've been working on. Hazard mitigation grants for updates to the pump house. It's a million plus dollar project and also part of our levy accreditation. Um, we can get feedback on the trail for the final um, update to the trail before they do the final design work and then bid that thing out and get it out of here. Um, and so it's just a lot of a lot of big things going on and then overseeing all the projects that are going to get started again. Waverly Road, uh, they finished up East Seward, Carol K will finish this week. So that roadway will be open. Yep, Friday. On Friday. Are so. we doing a ribbon tag? No. <laughs> Jonathan. <laughs> We don't need those guys in red coats there. Um, so, you know, we brought up last meeting about our streets, especially by the new uh, coffee shop and fast mark. Are we going to fill in those potholes? Oh, oh, the 10. Mindy, that's on Monday, right? Yes. And DOT in the street department. On Monday, they're going out on to do that. Right now, we put out a social media post. I think it talked to Bob Myers that. NDOT is partnering with us, they and they're going to go out and start cutting like whole sections out and then replacing it. So, so it was scheduled for a few weeks ago, and due to weather, it was delayed. Yeah, I, I know, but okay. when you go in the, and get a bottle of pop at the store, <laughs> what do you hear when you're getting a bottle Low of pop? Low riding cars. <laughs> yes, that's fun. <laughs> and who is responsible for those streets? I would say the state. Well, I think we kicked that back to us. I yeah, I think it falls to us. Yeah. But that, that, that quiets them down because when you say the state. Um, I can answer any other questions that you may have. Um, one other question. One thing that we brought up before is, especially in front of uh, the Mexican restaurant, uh, about the blind spots. Yep. And where are we at? With that? We, I had Tim, and we brought that up. Is looking at we're looking at the ADA right now. We met and met this morning with the county uh, board, and we're going to bring you a number of other parking ones, and we're going to include that in it. Because we're also looking at a handicapped stall for a spare time, I think, now. Yes. And then we're realigning and adding more on the courthouse closer to their ADA access. That's why they met with the uh, chair Culver this morning. Yeah, because with, the, with et cetera and that and across the Mexican restaurant, and as popular as the Mexican restaurant is, that's Horrible. I still really want to realign that whole intersection. The, the reason that intersection is is the, the nightmare that it is is actually because of it's technically it's the courthouse square. It's sucked back in, so it is not the intersection is not square, and that's what's causing the issue. That's what the sightline issue is. So no. Yeah, I should have heard what he said. You didn't hear him. I wanted to that first, but then I was like, mm. But we're, we're just going to go through methodically and cover the blocks as we go, and we'll add that um, contact car to that corner. I like her. Stoplight. Stoplight. Used to be one there in years. Ah. There's a four-way stop when I'm in the car. You said Boston. Move to accept the report. Second. Move by Schmidt, second by Miller. <laughs> Motion and a second. Please call the roll.
same way that we can take a look at that to see for the residents that live around that that they're not being woke up at three o'clock in the morning due to tracking. You know what I'm saying? So we can take a look to see if there's anything on there. We, we currently have a time when power checks will go around that only applies to residential business areas. That's the issue. That, that does not apply to the CBD. Okay. okay. It's so, yeah, all other zoning except the CBD. Yeah. Okay. Um, Much appreciated. Thank any, you. Any other? Not. Uh, Jonathan? Yes. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, real uh, quick thank yous. Um, the annual cleanup day was a success. On Saturday, April 24th, we counted 212 cars that dropped off hazardous waste. And we appreciate the Four Corners partnership on this and everyone's um, promotion of that event. We haven't officially heard back on the scrap metal and old electronics collections numbers yet. Uh, we'll share that when we, when we get them. Constant flow of traffic from 7.30 to 11.55 a.m. So thanks for that support. Uh, thanks also for the support for the virtual annual awards banquet on uh, Monday, April 26th. Um, a lot of generous people with the experience box and we encourage you to check out the uh, awards winners uh, videos that we've put up on Facebook and so to celebrate with um, the awards winner, a lot of um, deserving uh, award winners this year. Um, we have a business uh, after hours networking event scheduled for Thursday, May 20th. Uh, we'll be encouraging participants to follow Four Corners Health Department's guidelines for hosting a safe in-person event. And we are starting to plan more in-person events slowly but surely, and we'll continue to follow guidelines. Uh, with that, that's all. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks, John. We we'll get next to a strategy session regarding real estate interests. Is there a motion? We would entertain a motion to go into executive session for the protection of public interest to discuss real estate interests with the city attorney and city administrator for a period not to go over 30 minutes. So moved. Second. Do a motion and a second. Move by Schmidt, second by Singleton. Please call the roll. Hendrick? Yes. Miller? Yes. Hanson? Yes. Hanson? Yes. Hanson? Yes. Now we will go to your executive session for the protection of the public interest to discuss real estate matters. For a period not to exceed 30 minutes, no action will be taken.